even in just this introduction part, we've learned a ton. So let's do a quick summary of what we've learned so far. Bitcoin was the first protocol to take this blockchain technology into the limelight and take these cryptocurrencies into the mainstream. Bitcoin is a sort of digital gold or a store of value, able to make transactions between users in a decentralized manner. Ethereum and other smart contract platforms take this blockchain technology one step further, enabling people to make smart contracts and decentralized trust minimized agreements. These smart contracts and decentralized applications can access and interact with the real world using something called decentralized Oracle networks. Chainlink is a decentralized network that allows us to build these hybrid smart contracts, which combines our on-chain logic with our off-chain decentralized data and decentralized computation, giving rise to our logic being completely decentralized and our data and external computation being completely decentralized, giving us all the features that traditional agreements and traditional contracts have. Now, these digital currencies like Ethereum and Bitcoin have value even without the smart contract part, having a censorship resistant decentralized store of value is immeasurably powerful in its own right. We have some links in the GitHub repository that'll teach you how this decentralized store of value flips traditional finance on its head. And it's another one of the great reasons for building smart contracts. But again, the easiest way to boil it down is trust minimized agreements or unbreakable promises. But let's also go into some of these other features that smart contracts have over our traditional environment. The first feature, of course, is that they are decentralized and they have no centralized intermediary. The different individuals that run one of these blockchains are known as node operators. And it's the combination of all these thousands of node operators running the same software, running these algorithms, running these smart contracts that make the network decentralized. We'll dive deeper into how that works later. The next feature is transparency and flexibility. In these decentralized networks, since all these individual node operators run this software, everybody can see everything that's happening on chain, meaning there's no shady deals, there's no weird things happening. Anything that's going to be unfair, people would be able to see and just not use. Everybody has perfect information and has to play by the same rules. Now, additionally, this doesn't mean that there's no privacy. The blockchain is pseudo anonymous, meaning that you aren't necessarily tied to an identity in real life. They also have the feature of speed and efficiency. For those of you who have ever tried to do a bank transfer or send money across seas, you know it sometimes can take two to three weeks when in fact, all these banks are really doing is basic math. They're subtracting money from your balance and adding it to some other balance. Why does it take so long? In the blockchain, all of these transactions happen instantly. Another instance for those in the financial world today know that clearing houses and settlement days can take a long time. In the blockchain, there's no need for any of that because they happen instantly. This obviously is much quicker, but it also makes for much more efficient interactions with each other. Security and immutability. Again, immutable means that it can't be changed. Once a smart contract is deployed, that's it. Whatever is in the code is going to be in the code forever. They cannot be altered or tampered with in any way. This means that the security is much easier. Whereas in a centralized world, somebody can hack into the server, jump into the database and change some numbers. You can't do that in the blockchain world. And since it's decentralized, in order to hack the blockchain, you'd have to take over half of the nodes, as opposed to in the centralized world, where you only have to take over one. In the regular world, if your computer and your backup computer go down, all of your data is gone. In the blockchain world, if your computer and your backup computer go down, all your data is safe because it's being run on all these other decentralized nodes. And even if a few hundred nodes or if a few thousand nodes go down, it doesn't matter because as long as one node has a copy of the blockchain, you're good to go. Hacking a blockchain is nearly impossible and leaps and bounds more difficult than hacking a centralized server. Not only that, but this is safer in the asset sense as well. All you need to access your credentials and your information and your assets is your private key, which is basically your password for all of this. And as we've discussed in the video, these smart contracts remove this counterparty risk, remove this centralized intermediary, remove these trust gateways that we have to do in Web2. When we engage with users and individuals, they don't always have our best interests at heart. Smart contracts remove this counterparty risk because once one of these contracts is created, they can't go in and they can't alter it and they can't let greed or ego or anything else get the better of them and alter the terms of the deal. And as we said, this gives rise to these trust minimized agreements or these programmatic unbreakable promises. We move away from brand based agreements to math based agreements 
where we can look at the cryptography, we can look right at the code and see exactly what something is going to do and how it's going to execute versus having to rely on a human being doing the right thing. With smart contracts and decentralized hybrid smart contracts, doing the right thing is infrastructural. All these pieces boil down to us having the freedom to interact the way we want to interact without having to be afraid that interacting like that is going to screw us over. This trust minimized piece, these unbreakable promises make interactions so much better. In the purely Web2 world, we're constantly bombarded with messages of projects and protocols pushing us to move or act in the direction that makes them more profitable. Versus in the smart contract space, we can see everything transparently and we can even engage and interact and be partially owners of the protocols and the interactions that we decide that we want to be a part of. So smart contracts have been around for a few years now. And what have they generated for? What industries have come about due to these smart contract platforms being around? Well, you've probably heard of some of these and some of these we've already mentioned, but let's give you a quick refresher. DeFi. DeFi stands for decentralized finance, and it gives users the ability to engage with finance and markets without having to go through a centralized intermediary. For example, like we said with Robinhood, you no longer have to trust that Robinhood would continue to give you access to the markets. You instead would be able to see in the smart contract Yes, I have access to the markets. Or in the 2008 financial crisis, you never have to trust that these groups and institutions are giving you the correct things on the back end. You can see everything transparently right on the blockchain. You can engage with things like money markets and sophisticated financial products easy, effectively, and securely. At the time of recording, DeFi has around $200 billion in assets under management and is quickly growing. If you're really excited about DeFi, we have a ton of DeFi examples showing you how to build and interact with these protocols in coming lessons. DAOs or decentralized autonomous organizations are another group that we've already mentioned. DAOs are groups that are governed completely decentralized by a set of instructions or smart contracts on chain. There are some massive benefits here where engagement's much easier, the rules are black and white, and you can see everything directly on chain. Voting and governance technology is completely decentralized. And the blockchain space is one of the big ones pushing how we can evolve politics and how we can evolve governance to make it more efficient, fair, and reasonable. And you better know it, we have some examples of how to build DAOs and how to work with DAOs in coming lessons. So be sure to watch those. NFTs stand for non-fungible tokens and can really be kind of described as digital art or just a unique asset. They can do so much more, but we'll keep it high level for now. Projects like Bored Apes and CryptoPunks have revolutionized the way that People get paid for their work, show off their creativity, status, and so much more. And yes, of course, we have lessons showing you how to create and interact with NFTs as well. So many other groups and so many other industries are being created as a result of this insane technology. And maybe after finishing the journey with us here, you go out and you'll be the one to pioneer the next industry or the next billion dollar idea. You've learned so much already. But now that we've learned a lot of this high level information, Let's finally jump in and let's make your first transaction and let's get you set up to interact with this new world. In this next section, we're going to get you a wallet and we're going to show you exactly what a transaction looks like and feels like. Let's dive in. This is the Ethereum website, ethereum.org. We are going to make a transaction on a test Ethereum blockchain. I'll explain what that means in a little bit. This is going to be our first transaction that's made on the blockchain. Now, again, this process that we're going to follow is going to work the exact same with Polygon, Avalanche, Phantom, and all these other EVM compatible blockchains. I'll explain what that means in a bit too. For now, just follow along and have fun. In order to make a transaction on any of these blockchains, the first thing that we need to do is we need to set up a wallet. So I'm going to go ahead and go to MetaMask because it's one of the most popular wallets and one of the easiest to use. We're going to go ahead and download it. I'm using the Brave browser, but it works for Chrome, Firefox, or really any other browsers. And it's just going to be a little extension in the top right hand of your browser. This way, we can really easily see at any times what we have in our wallet. So we'll store all of our Ethereum-based currencies. So I'm going to go ahead and install MetaMask for Brave. Add to Brave, add extension. And now we can go ahead and get started with working with Brave. This is the first step you absolutely need to take when starting your journey and one of the easiest steps to take. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. 
and we're gonna create a brand new wallet. So we're gonna go ahead and hit create wallet. If you already have a wallet, you can actually import it via I have a seed phrase. And we'll talk about this seed phrase or secret phrase in a little bit. So let's go ahead and create a new wallet. And sure, we'll agree to help out MetaMask. Now we will create our password, make sure that this is really secure. For the purpose of this demo, my passwords are just gonna be password, but please don't have that be your password. You may also get a video like this teaching you about your secret recovery phrase. This is the same thing as your mnemonic, but secret recovery phrase is a lot more clear as to what it is. And again, they give us a ton of different tips on how to actually store it and keep it safe. The main takeaway from this is never share this. Absolutely never share this. So we're gonna go ahead and, and click reveal secret words. I'm showing you guys here because uh, this is just a demo and I don't really care. However, if you show this secret phrase to anybody else, they will have access to all the funds in your application. So everything that we're gonna do in this tutorial, we're gonna use fake money, we're gonna use not real money, so it doesn't matter. Now for the purposes of testing and developing, I always recommend using a completely separate MetaMask, a completely separate wallet. So for going throughout this entire course, if you already have a wallet or if you already have a MetaMask, please just set up a new one, create a new profile, create a new MetaMask, and this will be your wallet that you use for the duration of this course. However, if you're gonna actually put money in here, you absolutely need to have this written down because if you lose access to this and or your private keys, which we'll talk about in a little bit, you will lose access to your wallet and you will lose access to all your funds. So they give some tips like store this phrase in a password manager like 1Password, write this phrase down on a piece of paper, put it in a secure uh, location, memorize it, whatever you wanna do, just make sure you have this backed up somewhere. I'm just gonna go ahead and hit download this for now. It's not best practice to save it to your computer, it is much better to use a password manager or write it down on a piece of paper or something. So we're gonna go ahead and hit next. And it's gonna ask us to verify that we actually have it written down. And we're gonna go ahead and hit confirm and great. And it gives us a couple other tips. Remember, definitely take these tips very seriously, especially if you're gonna use this for real money. Like I said, for this demo, we're just gonna use test money. So it's not as big of a deal, but if you put real money in, you absolutely need to back up this seed phrase or secret phrase, or we're going to refer to it as our mnemonic phrase. Awesome. Now we can see the interface of our wallet here full screened. And depending on your browser, you can actually come up and pin it to your browser so that you can just click it up in the top right and it'll drop down and you can see the same interface here. Our mnemonic phrase, that secret phrase, those that secret 12 words that they gave us have given us access to a new account. The address of our account is located right here. In fact, if we click it and copy it to our clipboard and go to a tool called a block explorer called Etherscan, we can actually paste our address in here and see details about our account. Etherscan, like I said, is what's known as a block explorer. And it's a way to view different addresses, transactions, and other happenings that happen with a blockchain. If we look at this address that we just created on Etherscan for Ethereum mainnet, we can see no transactions have happened. There's really no analytics. There's no comments. There's no balance. There's no value because it's a brand new wallet. And this address that we just punched into Etherscan represents our unique address, our unique wallet, only identifiable for us. We'll talk about Etherscan a little bit more in a bit because it's a tool that we're going to use quite often. In wallets like MetaMask, you can actually even click right here and create even more accounts. So let's go ahead and create a new account. We'll call this Count2. As you can see, this one has a different address. So if we click this one, we go back to Etherscan, we paste the address in here, we hit enter, we can see another address, again, that's uniquely identifiable to us right here. It has zero balance, no value, no transactions. Now, if we go back to our MetaMask and we click the little button, we can see we have two different accounts in here. It's the same if we hit the extension in the top right. Click the button, we have two different accounts. The 12 word secret recovery phrase allows us to create multiple accounts all with the same secret recovery phrase. So that secret recovery phrase will give us access to both account one and account two and any other accounts that we create by hitting this create account button because it gives you access to all the accounts in your MetaMask. Now, these addresses of both of our accounts 
are the public unique identifiers, but they also have a private unique identifier only identifiable to us. Similar to the mnemonic, these are private identifiers we never want to share and we never want to give out. They're private. This is known as your account's private key. So the mnemonic will give you access over many of these accounts. The private key will give you access to just one of these accounts. We can see it by hitting these little three dots, going to account details and export private key. You'll just have to punch in your password here and you'll be able to see your private key. This is going to be your private key for your account. You can think of your private key as a password for your account that lets you create transactions. Now, the reason that I'm showing mine on screen is because I'm not going to put any real money in here. And this is just going to be a burner account for this tutorial. And I highly recommend, once again, you use a burner account. You use accounts that you never put any real money into. And along the way, I'll show you how to make sure that you don't do that. But normally, it's not a good idea to show or share your private keys or your secret recovery phrase. If somebody gets a hold of this private key, they will have access to my account one. However, they won't have access to my account two. If they get a hold of my 12 word recovery phrase or mnemonic, they'll have access to both accounts. And this is why when people say, keep your private keys safe, your keys, your Bitcoin, your keys, your Ethereum, they're talking about both your mnemonics or your secret recovery phrases and your private keys. Keep those private. Your public addresses are totally public and anybody can view your accounts on something like Etherscan or any other Explorer. And it's totally okay for people to share their public addresses. If you lose your private key, you lose access to one of your accounts. If you lose your mnemonic, you could potentially lose access to all your accounts. Uh, basically, what I'm trying to say is back these up and keep them in safe places. For this course, it's OK if you lose one since we're not putting any real money in them. But in the real world, be sure to do this. And great. Those are some of the main security considerations here. Now, if you look up in the top right, right next to that account button that we've been clicking, you also see this thing saying Ethereum mainnet. This is our networks tab. And if we click it, we can see a list of all the different networks that we currently have access to. Ethereum mainnet is the main network of Ethereum. And this is where real money is spent and used for transactions. For this course, we're not going to be working with Ethereum mainnet. We're instead going to be working with something called a testnet. Since we're engineers, oftentimes we're going to want to test and see what our code is actually going to do and how to interact with it. We're going to use a combination of local networks and test networks to actually do this, to actually test our smart contracts. We're mainly going to use local networks, but we'll get to that in a little bit. To see some of the test networks that come default with MetaMask, we hit show slash hide test networks. This will bring us into the settings page and we just hit select this to show test networks in the list and we just hit on. Now, if we scroll back up, We'll close out of the settings. We hit the networks tab again. Now we can see all of these other networks here, like Robston, Coven, Rinka B, and Gorelli. These test networks are networks that resemble Ethereum or Polygon or Avalanche or Phantom or any of these other blockchains. And we can actually switch our accounts to one of these other test networks. Let's click Rink B, for example. We can see that on the Rink B test network, we also have zero Ethereum. We have no money or nothing in here. We have a blank Rinkby wallet. These test nets work nearly identical to how Ethereum mainnet works, except for they run with not real money. They run with fake money as a way for us to learn and interact and see how these different smart contracts actually work together. At the time of filming, Rinkby is one of the most popular test networks, along with Coven. So we're going to work a lot with Rinkby in this tutorial. However, be absolutely sure to check our GitHub repository to make sure that you're always up to date with the best test network for following along with the tutorial here. Since they're test networks, people are running them out of the goodness of their hearts. And sometimes the best ones actually change. So, so be sure to follow along with the GitHub repository. We might also use Coven from time to time or maybe even Gorilla. So we're going to show you how to use a couple of these different test nets. In fact, if we go to the GitHub repo associated with this course, we can see recommended testnet is indeed currently Rink B. So that's what we're going to work with. Should this change, you should be able to follow along with another testnet and we'll leave notes as to how to continue. Now, what we can do actually is we can go to Rink B Etherscan. So we can go to 
can look up Ringby Etherscan, and it looks like it's the first thing that shows up. Ringby.etherscan.io. We can punch in this same address, copy it, paste it, and we can see some of the details of this address on the Ringby Etherscan. Like I said, right now it's totally blank. This network's interface later on is also how we're going to be able to work with Polygon, Avalanche, etc. We'll just have to add networks, but we'll get to that in a bit. And just to reiterate, test nets are free and for testing our smart contracts and mainnet networks cost money and are considered live. Now, I also do want to put a caveat here that we do want to keep in mind that these test nets are being run at the goodness of people's hearts. So we don't want to abuse them. We want to use them to learn and then move on. So try not to send a billion transactions on one of these test nets. In fact, what we're going to do right now is we're going to send a transaction on the Rinkby test net. And this will show us exactly what it would look like on a main network. In order for us to simulate one of these transactions, we're going to go to what's called a faucet. And if you go to the GitHub repository associated with this course, right underneath the recommended test net is going to be a test net faucets, which is going to show us where the most up-to-date faucet location is for us getting testnet Ethereum. So here we are at faucets.chain.link, which again is the recommended faucet. And what we can do is we can actually put our wallet address in and get some testnet link or testnet Ethereum. Now, what we are going to have to do is we are going to have to connect our wallet to the Rinkby network. So we're going to come down. We're going to switch from Coven to Ethereum Rinkby. And then we're going to make sure our MetaMask is on the Rinkby test network here. Once both of those are set up, we're going to go ahead and hit Connect Wallet. And we're going to choose MetaMask. Once we do that, our MetaMask is actually going to pop up and say, would you like to connect to this website? Connecting to a website is how we give these websites an interface to interact with our wallets and interact with our MetaMasks. Don't worry, we're not sending any transactions like this. We'll get to that in a bit. So we just we can pick an account we want to connect. Let's choose our account one. We'll hit next and then we'll go ahead and connect. Now that we're connected, we can actually see our account connected up here and that little warning is now gone and our wallet address is automatically placed into here. We're going to make our first test transaction. And for now, we don't need test link, so we're going to leave that off. But later on, we're going to come back and get that test link. For now, we're just going to need 0.1 test Ethereum. So let's go ahead and complete the security by choosing the traffic lights. And we're going to hit send request. What this is going to do is we're asking this faucet to send us 0.1 test Ethereum. Testnet faucets are ways for us to get money into our wallets on a testnet. And this is why this testnet Ethereum isn't worth any actual money, since we can get it for free. These don't exist on mainnets. You can't get real Ethereum or real money for free on a main network. So we're on Rinkby, we're getting fake Rinkby Ethereum, and we're going to go ahead and hit send request. Once we hit send request, this transaction hash is going to pop up here. And it says transactions have been initiated waiting for confirmation. This means that some other wallet is actually going to send us 0.1 test ETH. And this is the transaction that it's doing to do that. Now we just have to wait for our transaction to finish verifying and finish going through. So now, if this doesn't work right away, I would recommend wait a minute and then just try it again. But what we can do is we can click this transaction hash. If that transaction doesn't show up, we can also just close this and we can copy our address here. And actually, we already see 0.1 ETH in our wallets here. But we can go back over to Rink B Etherscan, paste our address in, and we can see that we now have 0.1 Ether as a balance. We can also see that we have a transaction with all this information going into our wallet. That's what this green in is for. If you click that transaction link, you'd get something like this. But if you didn't, don't worry, because on the Etherscan, if you click the transaction hash in the transaction list, you can also see all the details like that. So now in our MetaMask, we have 0.1 ETH. Again, this is fake Ethereum, and we have a transaction associated with our wallet now, which is awesome. Again, though, if we switch networks, if we switch networks back to Ethereum mainnet, you can see that we have nothing on Ethereum mainnet. Or if we go to Robston, we also have nothing. We only have this 0.1 ETH on the Rinkby test network. 
If you want to practice working with another testnet and the faucet that we're using has multiple testnets, let's go ahead and try it. Doing this section right now is completely optional. You can watch or you can follow along. But for example, I can see in my wallet that we already have Coven supported. So maybe I'll switch to Coven. Maybe we'll switch to Coven in the drop down here. We'll remove test Ted link because we only need test ETH. We'll hit I am not a robot and we'll send request and the same things will pop up. This time, this is going to be for the Coven testnet. And once our transaction finishes going through, now, same thing on Coven here, like what we did with Rinkby, once our transaction finishes going through, we'll see 0.1 test ETH on the Coven network. If you want to go ahead and try working with another one of the test nets, like maybe for example, Coven, I recommend you go ahead and giving it a try, but it's completely optional. And I would always refer back to the GitHub repo to make sure you're working with the most up-to-date faucet and testnet. And if we look back at Etherscan, we can actually see more details on what actually just took place. What actually just happened? How did our MetaMask get a balance of 0.1 ETH all of a sudden? Well, if we look down in the transaction section, we can see that there's a transaction here. Some address sent us 0.1 Ether. And if we click the transaction hash, we can see more details about what actually went down with this transaction. Now, understanding what's going on in this transaction is essential to learning and being a smart contract developer or just engaging with the ecosystem. So let's learn. The first bit at the top is this transaction hash. This is a unique identifier for this blockchain or this testnet that identifies this exact transaction. This transaction hash identifies sending 0.1 ETH to our address. We can see that the status of this transaction was successful. It didn't break in any case. We can see the block number that this transaction was included in, and we'll get to blocks in a little bit. We can see the timestamp, which of course is when this transaction occurred. We can see which account it was from, which if we go ahead and open in a new tab, we can see that this is the account that this transaction came from. And it's got 3 million Ether. Of course, this is fake Rinkby Ether, so it doesn't really matter. We can also see who it was to, which again is just us. This is our wallet address, 0x1066, blah, 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 0x1066, blah, 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 right? The value of this transaction, of course, is 0.1 Ether. Now, what's all this that we see Ask the value. So obviously the value is 0.1 because that's how much we sent. But we see this transaction fee and this gas price. If we hover over the tooltip, we can see if you zoom in on your Etherscan, you see amount paid to the miner for processing the transaction. And we see a gas price, which is cost per unit of gas specified for the transaction in Ether and GUI. The higher the gas price, the higher the chance of getting included in the block. Now, if we scroll down even more and we click see more, we can also see a ton of other information here. For now, we're just going to click to see less and just focus on these two. I'll explain all of these in a later session.